Dennis Shirley, I'm so proud to wish you welcome. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, it's turned on. I hope everybody's doing all right today. That was an invigorating performance. And we could see what our young people can do if we broaden our definition of achievement. Achievement, right? Some might wonder, well, maybe all achievement has to be measurable. I wonder how you measure that performance. So my, my subject today is achieving with integrity an interpretation of new international research findings. Let me give you an outline for what I'd like to do in the time we have together. First of all, I want to give you a very brief overview of four ways of change. Some of you are familiar with this argument, but the argument is developing over time with additional evidence and additional elaboration. So I would like to update you on that, and then that will incorporate looking at the most recent round of PISA results and seeing if we see any patterns from which we can learn. There's a lot of buzz right now about Germany's improved achievement. I want to try and look at that sympathetically and critically and creatively with you all. And then my own home state of Massachusetts seems to do uh, very well, even though the United States is not doing particularly well on PISA. We're a little bit right there with you in Norway, so I feel your pain. Uh, so we'll look at the Massachusetts exception, and then we'll move towards what I hope is the beginning of a new interpretation. Um, so that's our agenda for the time that we have together. This builds on research I've been doing for a while. There's a lot of discussion here today about collaborations between researchers and schools. Um, one of the things that I believe is that every now and then it's good to have a professional crisis if you're an educational researcher and just go spend time in schools. And the teachers are often dealing with existential dilemmas, instructional dilemmas. And if we just stay with them, we can help them to work on those dilemmas. And even if sometimes the dilemmas are too overwhelming, if the children are really coming from incredibly troubled home lives or have got issues like uh, fetal alcohol syndrome that they're struggling with, just being in solidarity with the teachers and with the principals does a lot to uplift the profession. So my book, The Mindful Teacher, is a book I co-authored with a grade two teacher in Boston that emanated from that kind of dialogical collaboration. Then Andy Hargraves and I did a book, The Fourth Way, which is very critical about recent trends in educational change. And we kind of did a, a critical argument first, and then we went and got the evidence base <laughs> afterwards in the next book, the, the Global Fourth Way. And uh, I'm soliciting articles for the Journal of Educational Change. I'm the editor. We get a lot of excellent contributions from uh, Scandinavia and, and from Norway. Um, so I, I'm doing that now, and that's contributing to my knowledge base. And then I was on the OECD team that studied lower secondary schools in Norway. So th that's helped to develop my knowledge base about what's happening. And what I'll be sharing with you today is just the very beginning glimmers. It's actually only the second presentation that I've done, the first one I've done outside of my university on what is an emerging outline for a new book called uh, Mindful Educational Change Towards Achievement with Integrity. The, the title will become clear in, in the course of the presentation. And because I have a lot of material, I'm afraid I'll be speaking fairly quickly. Can you keep up with the pace? of the English, okay? And this will be available on, on film uh, afterwards um, on a website that you can access. Earlier today, we, we heard a colleague uh, presenting a number of professional dilemmas that he has in a school, a, a head teacher. And I was very impressed by the way he kept on referring to this theme of what's best for the students. So if you forget everything that I say today, but if you just remember what's best for our students, that's the one thing. I, I think that that is, for me, at the core of this quest for achievement with integrity. It's an integral profession is one where we're always asking and probing what's best for our students. We don't get too distracted by other things. There's all these shiny objects in the world of educational change, and we need to focus on the mother load. And for me, the, uh, the mother load is right here. It's this magical interaction that a teacher can create with students around a curriculum. And this is kind of the utopia. When we get involved in educational change, we, we have fantasies 
about the rich interactions we're gonna have with our students and how they'll be interactive and transform their lives forever. But the reality of our classrooms often looks more like this, okay? Where one student's coming in late, another one is daydreaming, another one is cursing the teacher under her breath, and the teacher is staring, ignoring disruptions and plotting a career change, okay? Because if you're ever in schools, there's a lot of stimulation, there's a lot that's going on, and teachers often go in with a huge amount of energy in the first few years. And then they learn, whoa, I've got to pace myself if I'm gonna survive at this. So it becomes a lot of trying to conserve energy. So our issue always is, well, what can we do to help these teachers? Okay, especially when, when, when they start hitting some of the tough spots in their careers. And we just heard that there's a lot of change. One of the things that's going on for educators internationally now is innovation overload. There's so many innovations that are coming at them that they just kind of say, no, I don't want any of them. I don't want, I don't want the bad ones that are maybe coming in from a, a well-intended but not necessarily research-based corporation. I don't want this one that's coming in from a parent group that just kind of came up with an idea. I am just gonna try and control what I can control in my space. But if we're not careful with that, then we just become a defensive profession, right? Then we just kind of embrace what we've always done. So how do we get out of this? Well, I, I think one of the themes that we've had, and this is an excellent topic for our conference, moving together, learning together, changing together. This is what we have to do. And we have to do this through critical dialogue. So I, I was kind of thinking earlier, people were so respectful, we have to listen to the students. I, I think we should listen to the students, but we should take them on as partners in conversations and in debates. Okay, I remember, ladies and gentlemen, why am I up here today? I'm always thinking, God, that's amazing. They invited me. What do I have to offer? It all goes back to 1966. I had a grade six teacher, and he wanted to teach us Einstein's theory of relativity. Complete madness, right? He was insane, right? He showed us a movie about it, and he tried to get us to understand that time and space might be related, right? And that time might speed up and it might slow down. And I knew that time could speed up because whenever I was playing in recess, the time just went by. And I knew that time could slow down because it was Friday afternoon, I wanted to go home. The minutes crawled. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted us to imagine that time could stop. And when I was just 12, he let us have these arguments with him. And it was such a great argument. He stayed with us for an hour after school and argued with us. And that was the day that I learned that school could be really exciting, that you could grapple with big ideas. So interaction, these are two teachers from Mindful Teacher Seminars I've been leading in Boston for many years. And these are teachers who are working in our toughest urban environments. Poverty, substance abuse, crime, all of these issues. They get together and they collaborate around the toughest issues that they're facing. So changing together. That has got to be our theme. And it's so important that we reach out in the research community to our practitioners. Please bear with me if you're already familiar with the architecture of this argument. It's being used increasingly internationally now about four different ways of change. Now, as I'm presenting these, please think back to Max Weber. Some of you may have read Weber in some of your qualitative research courses. He, he described ideal types. Ideal Tupen in Germany said, like, nowhere are these things found in their purity, but they're clustered together because they seem to have certain kinds of affinities with one another. So the, I'm going to briefly describe four ways of change, and you can think about your context, okay, if you're a teacher, if you're a head teacher, if you're a researcher, and how they fit into change in Norway right now. I think a lot of Norway is with this first way of change and now evolving out of this. So, in my context, in the US or in England, this would be back around the 1960s. This was a time when teachers had lots of academic freedom. They could do what my teacher, Mr. Levine, did. Nobody came in, nobody looked at a pacing guide, nobody had any way of evaluating whether we went off topic. Teachers had a lot of academic freedom and they could be broad and engaging with the curriculum. There was no language about, well, we have gateway subjects, literacy and math, and then there's everything else. Okay, there was a broad humanistic curriculum. A lot of passive trust between parents and the profession. Okay, parents weren't getting in and challenging, they just kind of said, here are the kids, do your stuff, take it from there. 
And we didn't have a language of accountability in education either. That's been the new term. I apologize for exporting that to you, okay? That's been a recent development. We used to just use an old-fashioned word, responsibility, your ability to respond to the learner. A lot of school-based innovation, bottom-up change. Okay, a lot of creed freedom for teachers to innovate with curriculum, and there was not a sense that there are some professionals who are much better than others. Okay, there was a sense we're all in this together, collectively, we all need to support one another, and then if you wanted to create change, there was always internal motivation as the driver of change. You wanna create change, there's internal motivation. So you actually didn't have to worry too much about translation, okay, the translation of research, because internally, you were motivated, you were curious, you were engaged with your students. So you could be the initiator of change and not just the implementer, nor even just the translator. You were writing the poem instead of translating the poem, if you will. Okay, so there was a lot of creativity in the first way of change. And if you think of Robin Williams and the Dead Poet Society, you know, he's getting the kids tearing the page out of the book, they're standing up on chairs, they're reciting poetry, it's thrilling. And after his untimely death recently, it's amazing the number of people that went into the profession because they were inspired by that example. But unfortunately for every Robin Williams, there were also teachers who were just stopped, slowed down, quietly, inwardly gave up, right? Because there was no kind of lateral or bureaucratic control of the profession. It was a golden age for the educators who want to shut the door and do their own thing. Okay. Not so good for creating a professional identity. Then what's moved in after this, and some of this I've been picking up today in some, some of the language here, so these things tend to spread um, around the world, is, well, we start off, and in the U.S., it's just in the 1980s, we're just going to suggest some professional standards here. Government starts getting involved and saying, well, we're just offering these standards. Well, please think about these. Work with us, and we'll create some standards. And then... Because we have standards, well, we want to know if we've met the standards, so why don't we create some standardized tests and all of the children can start taking these tests and that way we'll know whether we get these goals. And if your school doesn't meet these goals, then we'll start competing with the public system. So you guys, maybe you worry about your municipalities or county governments and all that. Well, if you just find that to be a huge headache, ah, eh, democracy is painful, it's frustrating, you create a competing system with tax dollars, okay, but with separately run boards of trustees. And then you just start a little bit in this phase, the idea of professional learning communities. So we identify that it is a problem that teachers often go into the classroom and shut the door. They often do that when there aren't enabling structures. So we're starting to create contexts in which educators can get together and explore issues that emerge in practice. These professional learning communities and our unions are involved in this. It actually was an American union president, Al Shanker, who suggested the creation of charter schools, who made some suggestions around standards. He didn't realize at the time how those things were gonna take off. And then as we get these test results in, we'll start ranking the schools and the systems and the morning paper, so you can see who's really good, who's okay, who's not so good. Okay, start with that kind of data accountability notion and responsibility recedes into the background. Okay, so first way of change, a lot of professional freedom, latitude, creativity. Second way, starting to just tighten the system up a bit, getting some data going in there, getting some marketplace orientation going. And then we get to what I believe right now is the new orthodoxy of educational change. It's international, it spreads everywhere. You go to Chile, there it is. You go to Sweden, there it is. You go to Australia, it's popped back up. What does it look like? First of all, we start increasingly standardizing teaching. Okay, the idea that there's kind of one set of best practices and the guru is John Hattie, right? Here's kind of all the meta-analyses. They tell us that frontal instruction is really good, okay? So we kind of go back to a traditional emphasis on academic content. So we start standardizing teaching and then we focus on literacy and mathematics. Mathematics because it's easy to test, literacy because, well, you absolutely have to have that to thrive in the other subjects. And we don't go on to science and history and many other disciplines often for budget considerations. Third, we start teaching a lot for the predetermined results. What are the goals we want to get to? We have to focus on getting to those. So a Mr. Levine who would kind of try and be creating some other juice, right, that he never really got assessed on, well, that's going to start feeling like, well, that's really peripheral to what we're about. OK? 
Okay, so we start really emphasizing what governments have established for goals, and then the testing starts ramping up. Right? Big debate going on in the US right now that the testing just got to be excessive in our systems. Right? So headlines in the New York Times, parent revolt, educator revolt, because you can always create another test. You can have kindergartners who come in, they come in from all over the world, and you can start testing them on their reading. Fluency, within the first three weeks, kindergartners, right? So we've kind of really been pushing testing at very, very high levels in the US. According to the OECD, we are the system with the most data in the world about our students. We'll see how that's contributed to learning in a little bit. A lot of bureaucratic control. Government really starts getting empowered, okay, to come in doing a, a lot of assessments from, not from colleague to colleague, but from the system down on the teachers. And then, because we don't really trust teachers that much, unfortunately, we are going to be looking at their test results and then we're going to start pegging salary gains to those that get the most results. And then you'll say, well, that's really unfair because I teach history or I teach music or I teach physical education. They'll say, no problem, we'll create tests for you too. Okay? So you start kind of turning our schools into, I mean, they're dreams if you're a psychologist of learning, right? Because you're turning all of these 50,000 schools okay, into, um, into sites for experimental studies. You start really believing in markets as the drivers of change. Innovation is driven by markets. The ideology is government cannot sponsor innovation. There's a wonderful book called The Entrepreneurial State, and the, and the author goes through and looks at all of the innovations that have gone on in Silicon Valley. Almost every single one of them was funded by the US government in one form or another. Okay? But the ideology is innovation only comes from the private sector. That's our third way. Now, you can kind of tell, you know, I kind of get a little bit worked up around these things. I'm trying to be objective, but failing. But just bear with me, okay? So what's beyond that third way of change? That's what I am now trying to focus my energy on. What could be beyond all of that data-drivenness? Because I see all of the distractions that's built into the system. I see so many wonderful educators who are saying, you know what, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. So in the US, we lose half of our entering teachers within the first five years. If you're in a stressed urban environment, we lose half of our teachers in the first three years. Adding more pressure doesn't lift performance. We have a saying, you can't fire your way to Finland. Okay. So how are we gonna change things around? Well, this is part of the quest for me. How can we have achievement, but also with integrity? And so the first thing is, Who's the driver of change? Well, you wouldn't kind of say to your doctor, we want the business community to be telling you how you're going to implement change. You wouldn't say to a group of lawyers, okay, you know, we want government to tell you everything about the law. The practitioners have to drive it forward. And to do that, we have to empower them to unleash their own creativity. We can't do that licentiously. There have to be some controls and regulations, but the premise has to be firm. The people who are in the daily contact with the learners who we hope will flourish have to be empowered to bring about those changes. So that's one of the things that we're trying to emphasize. Then equity is a path to excellence. We're trying to learn from you, the Nordic countries. Please don't go down. We're counting on you guys, okay? <laughs> equity is a path to excellence. If you kind of give every child a, a strong social foundation, we saw some of the charts earlier in earlier presentations, but this is well known in the literature. It's hard for children to thrive in conditions of poverty. And then we're trying to move beyond education and teaching as an individualistic craft, as a privatistic enterprise, to education and teaching as a collective enterprise. I come into your classroom, give you feedback, you come into my classroom, give me feedback, and we're not just nice to each other all the time. Oh, you did everything wonderfully, now tell me I did everything wonderfully. You know, remember that book from the 70s, I'm okay, you're okay? <laughs> oh, we're all so good, that's so nice. No, we have to kind of say, you know, there's three kids in the back who weren't paying attention, okay? Or that one student over there was daydreaming, completely lost. We have to help each other to get better. And if we can do this with some integrity, right? You take some risks, you try out some new things, you make a mistake and your colleagues forgive you, okay? Because we're in learning institutions 
then we can really uplift the profession and we can do this in a democratic way. We don't have to just imitate Shanghai, if you will. You can have a democratic ethos of participation. It doesn't mean you have to vote on everything if you're a teacher, but you have a democratic ethos and you care about student voice. Okay, giving those young people opportunities to bring their own voice to the enterprise. It's kind of a little bit irrelevant, but there's two stories I'm sharing. One is Mr. Levine, okay, theory of relativity. Second one is Mrs. Alexander. I had her in 10th grade. She was like Dolly Parton. She had a beehive hairdo, went straight up to the clouds, right? Her hairdo was registered as a lethal weapon. I'm just kidding. It wasn't real, okay? You know, Texas, short, strong southern accent. My father was in Vietnam, second tour of duty. Okay, I was alienated, upset with schooling and all that. She said to me, Dennis, I can tell you're checked out. What do you do something independently for a while now? I said, great, uh, can I come up with a book I'll read with you? She says, yeah. I say, okay, I'll read Moby Dick. Why Moby Dick, I have no idea. Read the whole book over the Christmas holiday, come in in January, and she says, Dennis, did you re are you ready to start Moby Dick? I said, I already read it, Mrs. Alexander. She said, great, what's the first sentence? I said, call me Ishmael. She says, wonderful. Now, can you tell me who Ishmael was in the Bible? No idea, no idea, I didn't know. Well, if you know, if we had more time, Ishmael is the son of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah can't have a child, so Abraham sleeps with the slave girl, Hagar. But then Sarah, when she's in her 70s, all of a sudden her womb is blessed, and she has a son, so Hagar and Ishmael get kicked out into the desert. So Ishmael is an alienated young man. He's an alienated young man. Call me Ishmael. And the whole book is about alienation and isolation and finding your way back into the human community. And it's such a beautiful book, especially in my country, because the friendship, the deep friendship that develops is between a white North American and Queequeg, who's from the South Sea Islands and is tattooed from head to toe. It's a, a story about interracial friendship and solidarity. Okay? Student voice at a teacher who came and said, you're alienated, come back into the community, come back into learning. So these things matter enormously to me and it matters enormously. I'm given opportunities like this to come to Norway okay, and to, to learn from you and I hope that I'll be able to share some of, some of my passion and knowledge base with you. International policy learning, not policy borrowing, policy learning, if we can put that forth. And then finally, environmental stewardship. Have you noticed it's extremely warm this fall? Something's going on out there, it's called climate change. Okay, this is, has to call for a collective response from the profession. And by the way, UNESCO and the United Nations called for education to be focused on sustainable development. Okay? So those are four ways of change. Now then, PISA you all know about, right? Probably hate it, Learning, Leaning Tower of PISA, so frustrating. Okay, and so you, you know it's kind of evolved from about 24 jurisdictions tested up to now, um, I think it was 60, um, yeah, 65 students in nations and territories, the last administrations, and the last results came out, I guess, in December of last year. Now, Andy Har Hargreaves and I were doing research and we were finding more and more schools that were all trapped in a kind of a third way swamp. Okay, so they were putting more and more pressure around tested achievement and they were trying to get the results up and they were really pounding away at the kids. And uh, we, the network we studied was in England. You can see there that England has actually been struggling on PISA for a number of years, okay? And so what we found was, well, they're really pounding away at these results and the network of schools we studied got some results, okay? But there was a real compromising of integrity, okay? Transformation, creativity, play, the social dimensions of learning, the emotional dimensions were all being compromised by an emphasis on um, test preparation, essentially. So what Andy and I did is we looked at our research, we had lots of arguments, we go hiking together. We go up on the Appalachian Trail and go hiking and arguing for three days. There is some beer at the end of the day after that, but I won't go there, okay? We looked at Finland, Andy had done an OECD study, I was working with a Canadian partnership around Finland. We looked at Singapore where we've both had endowed chairs, and then we looked at Alberta and Ontario and Canada. We said, huh, okay, we seem to have a cluster of nations that do quite well here, and then we have England and the United States that aren't doing so well, but we know of individual networks or schools in those contexts that have done well. So what could we learn from that? So we came up with this argument that there are glimmers of a fourth way, 
that are happening in many different jurisdictions. And uh, maybe we can learn about what those glimmers are. And I think you have some here for us in Norway. So just to review the argument briefly, we looked at the case of Finland. And uh, in the next book, I'm going to have a, a subsection. And it is going to be called, Don't Use the F Word. Because <laughs> policymakers in the US, they hate Finland. Because it's doing all these egalitarian, child-centered, child-friendly things that are the opposite of us and getting those results. And that actually was said to a colleague of mine, uh, J.C. Couture of the Alberta Teachers Association, when he was getting ready to go into a meeting, uh, a, a colleague said, don't use the F word. So the big idea of Finland that we try to present there is that there's a kind of a professional capital that's very different from the business capital that we can identify in Finland. And so there's a strong emphasis on human capital, the individual knowledge base of the people that enter the profession, social capital. It's a very flexible system. People can collaborate. Lots of break time, okay? lots of movement um, in the schools. And there's strong social trust with the community. There's strong moral capital because over half of Finnish kids get some kind of special education help by the time they graduate. So to be special is to be in the majority shifts the culture of what special education means. There's very strong symbolic capital because to be a teacher is very high status. So you've got that kind of giving you a special energy in the community. And then decisional capital, latitude, the opportunity to make choices. You're not being driven to make the decisions that somebody else already made to you, AKA implementation. Okay, you have some expertise. You have some knowledge, you have some experience, you've studied research, you've done some research. So we think that Finland is a strong case for this idea of professional capital. Then we also look at Singapore, which has had a lot of testing in the past. It's at the very top of the PISA examinations. Interesting paradox is in Singapore for a number of years now, the theme from the Ministry of Education has been teach less, learn more. Teach less, learn more. In other words, telling teachers, you've got 10% white time, create something. Because the big issue that's going on in Asia right now is that they've been very good at transfer of knowledge. But if you kind of said, well, what patents have come out of the People's Republic of China, or even South Korea, or Singapore, or many other countries, not very good on inventions. Okay, so they want to start creating, and they realize you're not going to be able to test your way to creativity. You have to find new ways to embed that in school and allow students to initiate more. Then in Alberta, we look at networks. So one of the big debates in the organizational literature is, well, can you innovate or can, should you improve? What should you do, right? And so often the innovators say, well, we, let's just try any number of crazy things and see what happens. And the improvement folks say, we don't want to innovate at all, okay, because that's risky. So we studied the Alberta Initiative for School Improvement in Alberta, which did a fabulous job in a, in a very test-driven system of going to educators in schools and saying, what kind of creative ideas do you have? Would you like to do something in environmental education if you're working with First Nations or Aboriginal kids? Would you like to do something with science education if you're working in the gas or oil industries? Would you like to do something with the arts? And so allowed educators to create their own ideas for driving change forward. Now you saw Alberta's been slipping a little bit in the results, but still very, very high in terms of the, the PISA results. And then we also looked at Ontario. We looked at a network of schools um, in Ontario that were focused on special education. And here we developed the idea of leading from the middle. Leading from the middle. So how do you activate people in the middle of the profession? It could be principles. They could be your county governors or school owners, people who are in the middle and get them networked together because often their workloads are overwhelming, so they fall into that isolation. And in Ontario, they were able to do this with, um, with strong student learning results. And then in England and the US, we didn't want to leave out these two jurisdictions where we've done so much work. So in England, we studied a school, the Grange Secondary School, where they had some of the worst results in the whole country. And you know, it's really hard to get your achievement results up if the students don't come to school. So they had to get the kids to come to school. So the, the head teacher went to see a therapist 
And he said, boy, I really feel awful. I hate my job and all my colleagues hate it too. And if it had been Southern California, the therapist would have said, oh, tell me about your mother. But it was England, the north of England. So he just said, wow, it sounds like a mess. You better go straighten it out. Okay, so then the head teacher goes out, starts rounding up all the kids, tries to find out, are the kids good at something? They turn out to be really good at visual arts. So then they start transforming the whole identity of the school into a visual arts school. And then that school rises up into the top half of the schools in England. Okay? Engaging the community, being inspirational, being creative, doing something that isn't part of anybody's script. Okay? Going back down to the mother load where the students are and the communities are. And then in California, we, uh, we had a European export there. His name was Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. We love Europe so much that we elected him our governor of California, and he was very successful, but he had the Bill Clinton problem. <laughs> I better stop right there. If this wasn't being filmed, I'd say something risque, but I'm being filmed, and who knows where it would end up. He had the Bill Clinton problem, okay? But before that, he got very good at taking money out of the government treasury, cutting it, and moving it into other places, so he took 2.4 um, billion dollars out of the California budget and he moved it to another location. And the California Teachers Association led a lawsuit and sued him and got the money to come back into the education sector. And then they created a network of 500 schools focused on lower achievement. We describe this in the global fourth way. So every now and then, part of professionalism means you have to choose a fight every now and then, right? So it's a certain kind of muscular professionalism. You have to have a little bit of attitude, a little bit of edge. In education, we're always so nice. There's a great Lyle Lovett song. You know, he says, I used to be so friendly. I used to be so kind. I used to be so forgiving. But once is enough. Okay? So in the education sector, every now and then, you know, it's, it's a democracy. It's political. You might want to say, oh, I, I hate politics. I don't want to play that game. Yes, but your piece is on the board. You want to move that piece? You want somebody else to move it for you. Okay, so those are some of the arguments that we had in the global fourth way. But meanwhile, what else has been happening with our, our friends at PISA? So I looked at this latest round of results that came out. Now, here's our OECD average. And you can see the United States kind of hanging around there, fluctuates up and down. England, Sweden, Germany. Just kind of make a little note of what patterns you see there, please. Okay, just make a little note. Okay, now let's look again. OECD average, US, sampling error there. UK, Sweden, Germany. Hmm. OECD average, US, UK, Sweden, Germany. What should we make of this? What should we make of this? If we had more time, you know, it'd be great. You could kind of like have a turn and talk right now and get everybody all worked up. Answer number one, nothing. It's meaningless. Stupid. I hate it. <laughs> okay, it doesn't mean anything because the tests aren't valid and reliable, nor could they ever be. PISA says, well, we, we test the application of academic knowledge to the real world. And then you kind of say to yourself, really, the real world? Tell me what that is. Does the real world really look the same in Vietnam as it does in Norway, as it does in Chile? What real world are you describing? It's just a fabricated world. And so if you hate the PISA tests, I recommend this new book. This is among the, this is a kind of the rock star favorite. It's like the Sergeant Pepper. When that came out in 1967, that's what this is now for, for 2014 in the US. Who's afraid of the big bad dragon? Why China has the best and the worst education system in the world? Have you guys had Yang Zhao over to Norway? Do you know him? He is so funny. You'll love him. He's a great guy. He was born in China, and he was a terrible farmer. His parents tried to get him to watch the water buffalo, and he, he couldn't do it. So they said, this guy is never going to make it as a farmer. Let's send him to school. Otherwise, he's finished. 
So now he's a professor in the US. <laughs> and he's been working with China a lot, except that after this book comes out, he'll probably never get another invitation, right? <laughs> because what he kind of says in this book is, well, in, in Shanghai, in China, everybody expected Chinese students to be the best. Because basically, we've had 5,000 years of, of um, autocracy. And on and off, we've had maybe 2,500 years of meritocracy with our tests for the Mandarin elite. So this is a country that has gotten very, very good at test taking and getting the kids to focus on the tests. And if it's not on the test, for heaven's sake, don't learn it. Excel at the test and focus, focus, focus on that test. And go to school all day. And then when you're done with school, go to a cram school in the afternoon on the weekends. And that's what education is. Okay, so Yang Zhao says, for heaven's sakes, in the United States, in Norway, in all these other jurisdictions, don't imitate Shanghai. Shanghai is thinking of giving up the PISA tests. Okay, because they know that it's a problem. It's not good for innovation or creative thinking. So if you hate the PISA tests, don't want to hear about them ever again. Just buy this book, read it, cite it, you know, by verse, memorize different lines, and you'll be all set and you'll be ahead of the cocktail party crowd, <laughs> okay? There's another interpretation. One of the question is, what should we make of Germany's improved results? Everything, because PISA is as rigorous as any international comparison is ever likely to be, and we have to have the courage to face up, okay, to, to, the, to the bad news. And so here, Shanghai is, is seen as a positive example. So here's a, a book by Mark Tucker, of the National Council on Education and the Economy, very influential thinker, surpassing Shanghai. Okay, and here the focus is, Shanghai is our model. We should imitate what they do in Shanghai. Come on, Americans, pull up your socks. Get your mojo going again. Let's go, okay? We can't be like, it's not true in Norway that people stop working at four in the afternoon, is it? I was reading that book, The World's Nearly Perfect People, Michael Booth. I don't know if people are discussing that. If you do, I'll stop working at four. Do you have any openings for a visiting professor? <laughs> so so if, if you like the PISA stuff and you say, okay, look, this is as good as it's ever gonna get with international assessments, then you can go out and you can buy Surpassing Shanghai. This just came out from an author based in uh, Singapore, Learning from Shanghai. She gushes with enthusiasm over Shanghai. Everything is magnificent that they do in their educational system. And then this is an incredibly downloaded report from the OECD, Strong Performers and Successful Reformers in Education, Lessons from PISA for the United States. Okay, so here, if you like PISA and you think it's great, then you can get these, and then nobody will ever invite you to a dinner party at a cocktail party in Oslo. Or I don't know, I'm, I'm being presumptuous. In the US, we're so tired of hearing about test results. We're just, we're, we're just about, fed up with all of that. But still, my interpretation is that we should approach the PISA results just like you would any other educational phenomenon. Sympathy and critique, okay? So it's another data point, okay? Try and learn from it, don't idolize it, okay? Don't be enslaved to it, interpret it critically. So let's just imagine, it's just a thought exercise now. Well, let's imagine that Germany's improved results mean something. They reflect some kind of improvement in student learning. What kind of interpretations could we have from that? Three different ones. I teach at a Catholic university. Everything's the Trinity. <laughs> so the first one, is the National Council, so that report, Strong Performers and Successful Reformers, okay, the OECD contracts with the National Council on Education and the Economy and the United States Department of Education to do a study about how the United States could learn from other places. And Mark Tucker and another scholar there looked at um, that report, or rather wrote that sections of the report. And here the, here the hypothesis is that Germany has used identical change strategies to those piloted in the US, and that's why they've been successful. Copy and paste. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> so the US is to be copied, Germany is to paste. It's fairly simple, okay? 
And that, that's the study, strong performers, successful reformers. And this is the official interpretation that good American citizens should read so that we understand what's going on in the world. First, in a way, the entire German story is a story about accountability. We came up with the idea of accountability first, but you know they're a little bit slow and behind us, but they've caught up. Okay? New performance standards describe in some detail subject-specific competencies that students are expected to meet throughout Germany, very much like what we do in the United States. Here's a long list of competencies. It's great with competencies because anybody can do it. All you need is a pen and a napkin and a beer on a Friday night. You can start writing up lists of competencies. I'm being facetious, but sometimes it feels that way. And then you need common assessments, right? So if you had a long tradition of local control, you start creating common assessments for the whole country. And then you start incentivizing people, so you can kind of see the market creeping in. Okay, we're gonna start creating more and more certificates and awards, especially for students. And then finally, you get this quote about all of the countries and jurisdictions studied. Virtually every country featured in this volume mirrors the race to the top's efforts to support recruitment, development, rewarding and retaining of effective teachers and principals. Isn't that wonderful? Finland is mirroring the United States. Singapore is mirroring the United States. Now, they did their reforms, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago. So what I kind of learned from this study is, if I'm in the US Department of Education, I can pay the OECD to write a report. Then they'll subcontract with the National Council on Education and the Economy. And then it comes back one last time to the US Department of Education. And they can insert this language. You see how a certain ideology spreads? An alternative model would be that you could actually ask people from those countries to write about what they did. Okay. If you're ever kind of wondering, why do these ideas start emerging? And, uh, you know, I love Pazi Salberg. We go hiking together, and he has done this whole analysis of the global education reform movement or the germ. But I've said to him, Pazi, we have to explain to people how the germ spreads, how it originates and spreads. And reports like this are excellent, excellent vehicles for spreading the germ. So that's one first interpretation. Now, a second interpretation are the Germanic explanations I've come across for explaining the rise. These tend to be official interpretations. Now, I know that there's lively debates within Germany about education and educational change. Okay? I'll be writing about those in the book. Right now, what you're kind of getting is an outline. So in Germany, some of the explanations have focused on this theme of really Fachdidaktik, right? Everybody knows that, right? I can say it in German and, yep, okay. So, the idea is the German context is unique, but Germany's come up with some really good strategies to get those results up. So yes, creation of national educational standards, there is agreement with the NCE, and then a lot of focus on this Fachdidaktik, okay? Focusing on reading abilities, building networks to promote math and science education, then increasing all-day schooling. German students had very little school attendance time when the first PISA results come out. Targeted support for students with a migration background. Germany was the worst of all of the nations on the first round of PISA around equity. And then um, getting a joint statement from unions and from government okay, that changes were necessary. Unions were concerned with equity. Government was concerned with accountability. And then increased funding and a professoriate who would say, okay, we're going to come on board. We're going to get involved in all of this measurement. Remember, these are kind of ideal types, okay? And these, these have to be refined. And I, I know that the, the actual on-the-ground realities are more complex. Now, here's what I'm trying to add to the mix. And I think this is important. Probing even deeper. So here, Germany is kind of going its own way, okay? Just like Norway needs to, just like every country needs to find its own independent solutions based on its own traditions. So my argument is that German change strategies initially can appear the same as in the US, the UK, and Sweden, but they're actually distinct and in some ways opposed to those other reforms. Why is this? First of all, there's an absence of distractors. 
You don't have all these fast track routes into teaching that are proliferating like crazy now. Do you guys have Teach First in Norway yet? Okay, so kind of little sidebar ways to get in the profession and you circumvent the training. Not a real focus on marketplace models of reform in Germany. There's lots of choice, but it's within the public education system. It's not so much organized against it. Not the charter schools we have in the US or the academies in England. In the US, we have this no child left behind policy that says all students will be tested at grades three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, and then most states have a high school graduation requirement. So it's been testing by census. Everyone gets tested. They haven't done that in Germany. It's been more testing by sample. You don't, if a school is struggling, you don't close it. Okay, reopen it as a charter school. You don't rank teachers against teachers. These things might come your way. I hope they don't. But I remember being in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles Times had ranking of all teacher results, okay, in the newspaper and online. And then you don't rank schools against each other also. They tried this briefly in a couple of states. So the interpretation is that in the US and the UK and germ affiliated countries, there's a lot of distractors that policy has thrown into the system that has led people away from a focus on the foundations. And then part of what we're trying to do with the fourth way interpretation is we're trying to say not all change comes from governments. Not all positive change comes from governments. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to be honest with you. If there hadn't been a civil rights movement in the United States, Barack Obama would not be our president today. Okay, change had to come from a social movement. It's the same thing that's going on in Chile right now. If we had waited for the profession to reform itself or waited for government to do it, nothing would have ever happened. The young people had to exercise student voice and say, we want to live in a fair society. So two really important parts of the fourth way change model is the premise and then finding the evidence that positive change can happen from the profession itself as well as from civil society. And in Germany, there's some very wonderful change networks. There's the Academy of the German School Prize. And this was supported by a couple of foundations, the Heidehoff and Bosch foundations, as a response to PISA. But what they wanted to do is uplift the profession itself. So they have six indicators. One of them is achievement, but it's achievement that would include young people doing a performance, volunteering for something in the community, helping one another. Last night, there was a demonstration here, right, against mobbing, against um, bullying and, and social media. So you do the opposite uh, of that, and that can be an achievement. You create a social media platform where young people can be responsible and compassionate for each other. So they have these wonderful indicators that are deeply grounded in the core principles and strategies of the profession in this Academy of the German School Prize. It's all up there online very much worth, worth checking out. And I've had the privilege of working with some of those um, educators. Let's see, how am I doing with time? The, the time that I have up here is 12.21. Oh, I've got 12 minutes left to go? I better pick up my tempo. You with me? Okay, you hanging in there? Okay, great. Then there's this wonderful network also, I'm Blick über den Sound, a look over the fence. And these are schools that are really anchored in that um, reform pedagogical tradition. In the US, we would say pr progressive education, where they realize that we often in education do a poor job capitalizing on the latent talent in our schools. So we don't need school inspectors to come in. We don't need standardized tests and all that, but we do need to do something. And that is to activate each other, to visit each other's classrooms, to ask critical questions, and to learn. You know, if I'm honest, some of the best teaching I've ever seen has happened in the most impoverished under-resourced schools. And they're teachers who are often hiding, right? Because they're doing creative things that maybe aren't really endorsed by the system. So finding those practices and learning from them is something that's, that can happen when we activate ourselves in these networks. And then Germany has also been struggling. You know, it's interesting in the United States, when we commit crimes, they're just random, right? In Germany, they often have a political edge. So right-wing extremism. Okay. So an, a, another foundation, the Freudenberg Foundation, created this one square kilometer of education program. And it's a lot like our Harlem Children's Zone in the US, but that's all affiliated with charter schools. They broke away from, from the public school system and are competing against it. One square kilometer of education is very much working in the traditional public school, reconquering the pedagogical space 
in the traditional public schools, and then helping immigrant parents to access resources, develop capacities, help their young people to get um, good jobs or to go on to higher education. And so the thing that I would want to add to these government-sponsored networks is that they're working with a long tradition of pedagogical reflection. You know, in Europe, you have these traditions. You have didactic. You understand that education has a normative, a moral foundation. It makes it different than instruction. There's a great article by Robin Alexander, Why No Pedagogy in England? You know, for some reason, pedagogy didn't make it across the English Channel. We got instruction instead, which tends to just be technical. Right. So I, I view this as a very strong and important part of the German response to PISA. So it's not really about outsiders coming in and dictating the profession, although there has been some of that. There has been some of that third-way juice, but there already was a fairly strong profession there that simply needed to be activated and catalyzed. So what are some implications of this from Germany? Promote public awareness. That was the PISA shock. It was covered in all of the newspapers. Test random samples of students. You don't need to test everybody all the time. Avoid policies that distract from core challenges. You know, when I'm in Finland, they say, boy, in the United States, you guys do everything the hard way. Instead of kind of coming up with all these strategies to teach kids in poverty, why don't you just reduce poverty? <laughs> Instead of coming up with all these ways to control teachers, why don't you just check at the very beginning and make sure you only get good people into the profession? Okay, you know, they, they kind of have these kind of very simple responses that we need to learn from. And then provide support for change networks that are driven by the profession itself. So that Academy of the German School Prize, okay, and Blick über den Zaun, um, and um, Ein Quadratkilometer Bildung. And then finally, enliven and energize civil society to support equity and solidarity. Civil society does have a role to do with this. And I know maybe in places like the US and in Norway, it sounds like politicians are getting into education a lot, okay? maybe messing around with things that they should leave to the profession. But I'm not quite ready to go with this route of just privatization and private control. So these are things we need to be thinking about. Romantische Straße. However, do not romanticize Germany. Okay, do not. Okay, still very high levels of social segregation, even though they're getting better. Early tracking of students is deeply rooted. I remember talking with a guy who was a firefighter, right? When he was 10 in Bavaria, they said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a firefighter. Okay, great. You're not going to higher education, right? <laughs> Discriminates against late bloomers. Emphasis on foundation building and core disciplines can limit innovation. This is what I worry about with Fachdidaktik. You know, you have Fachdidaktik and then you have Allgemeindidaktik, the education of the whole person. How can we hold on to that tradition? And then finally, this lack of transparency about what's going on, that creates problems of its own. I don't necessarily have a resolution for that, but I'm not sure that um, keeping results quiet is the way to go. So, covered the four ways of change, reinterpreted PISA, now looked at this German riddle. Now let's quickly go and wrap up with Massachusetts. So there's Massachusetts up there, you know, about where Finland is, okay, where Alberta is, Ontario, in reading. What's going on with Massachusetts? Doesn't this indicate that some of the policies in the US have been really successful? Okay, I don't think so. I think that we have to try and understand some of the dynamics there. So Massachusetts has 60 higher education institutions, 60. Okay, during the academic year, like right now, one out of every 10 people in Boston is a student. Okay, it's an amazing concentration of talent and exchange and learning at the higher education level. Okay. So one of the things that you could learn from Massachusetts is create a lot of higher education institutions put them in close proximity to another, get them cooperating and competing with one another. Okay. And then people who want to be around higher education institutions will move there because they want to be with that energy, right? So, so that's one advantage that we have, and we have a lot of partnerships going on with schools. Okay, that mindful teacher seminar that I described, that was all based on partnerships. It's very highly respected in the city. Boston is 
often voted as the number one innovation city in North America. We're affluent. We have the second highest per capita income. Our unions are strong. They defend the profession. And we also have a relatively strong welfare state compared to the other states. Some people joke that Massachusetts is the western extremity of Europe. I kind of like that. Okay? And then finally, Massachusetts gets a poor rating from the advocates of the global education reform movement. We get a grade of C, average, because we don't really favor homeschooling or charter schools or competition or all of those other things. We favor a strong traditional public school system. Okay? So we should not learn from Massachusetts how wonderful the germ is. So let's move towards a new interpretation. PISA is one reference point. Study it, learn from it, don't worship it. Comparative data is useful, okay? But like any data, be critical. And then the thing I worry about the most with uh, all PISA and Tim's and Pearl's and all that is a certain epistemological nationalism. It's nation against nation. That's actually probably not what we need right now. We need to figure out new ways of learning how to live together. And then I, I'm struggling right now to try and recover the grandeur of the enterprise of education. The grandeur of the enterprise. I think every day you have an opportunity to interact with young people. And I, I love this Primo Levi. In education, we have to read stuff from outside of education. So I'll try and describe one scene from uh, Levy's autobiographical book of his experiences in the Auschwitz concentration camp. And it happens in the middle of the book. He is um, going to get food. Okay, and that's a great thing. If you're in the concentration camp, you have to go and get food. And he's with a, a young man from Alsace. And they know a, a route to get the food that is a little bit longer than the direct route. And the young man is saying to him, oh, please teach me some Italian. Okay, teach me some Italian. I want to go to Italy when this is all over. And so Primo Levi wants to teach him something beautiful. He doesn't want to teach him, you know, how to count or this is how you say stone, this is how you say hammer. So he's walking along in Auschwitz and he's trying to remember some lines from Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno, and there's a section there, the Canto of Ulysses. And it is beautiful lines. And, and, the, and they go like this. Forget not from what noble seed you were born. You were not born to be beasts, but to strive for virtue and knowledge. Virtue and knowledge. And Primo Levi says, it was like a trumpet of God. For a moment, I forgot where I was. For a moment, I remembered that I was a human being. So hopefully our students don't end up in that kind of extreme situation. But I would like our education to prepare them for the many adversities that they will face in life. And that means that we have to muster ourselves to remember that every day we're helping to shape their identities. And we can give them resources to, to challenge life's um, arrows and afflictions. So I often go back to John Dewey with this. We don't have to do things in opposition. Okay, I've said some critical things. I want some accountability. I want a lot of responsibility. I want some freedom, but I also want some safeguards. All of us want these things. If we go back to Dewey's Democracy and Education, which will be 100 years old in another two years, we look at how somebody could be socially critical, but they could also be unifying in their thinking. So Dewey wrote about the school and the society, the child and the curriculum. These were points on a continuum. Democracy and education. They have to be related. We heard earlier that about 80% of student learning, it varies based on who's done the study, but about 80% has to do with factors outside of school. You can't think you're going to bring about substantial educational change only within the school. Do we put together discipline and interest? If you're really interested in doing something, you have to approach it in a disciplined way. And if you are disciplined, then often you can awaken interest. You put together labor and leisure. leisure. Were the students up here singing, were they having fun? Were they disciplined? Yes, they were. So we can put together different phenomena in a synthesis. And then finally, this is coming up at the end now, learning the treasure within. This is a report that came out from UNESCO. And they really had a beautiful vision for what education would be in this century. And I'm, I'm worried that we're losing it. It had four components, learning to know, Okay, so learning to think, 
learning to make, learning to do things, but also learning to be. What would learning to be mean? Okay. Kind of be a good person, be centered in yourself, have a strong sense of identity. And then what UNESCO said, the most important one was learning to be together. Learning to be together, they said, was the major challenge for the new century. So I hope that as educators, we take this as a kind of a clarion call to call us back to the roots of our profession. We have to be the people who are always asking what's best for our students. Our society, our students, our parents, they're all counting on us for that. So in the end, we'll have a legacy. You cannot not have a legacy, by the way. You can't opt out. You have a legacy of one kind or another. And we'll have to decide, do we leave a world for our young people in which they have learned how to be, to be at peace with themselves, to live together in harmony? Or are we leaving a very different kind of world for them? So our time is always limited for these things, but you have to make choices. I hope I've helped to provoke some of your thinking this afternoon, and I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Tusen Tak. Thank you very much for sharing. I just wonder, are there any questions for Dennis? No? Uh, yes. Sorry, just find a microphone for her. So, where are you coming Thank you, Dennis, for a very thought provoking uh, and inspiring uh, keynote. Uh, you said one, one thing. Uh, you said that we need to reconquer mm. the educational space. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was wondering during your whole talk, how could it happen that it was in a way taken away from us? Mm. But I think you gave several explanations as to how it had, has happened and maybe also why it has happened. But do you have any reflections on uh, advices for school leaders in how they can uh, help their teachers and their schools to reconquer this educational space? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful question. So here's one of the things that I worry about, um, that all of the managerial tasks that are being put on school leaders now are reinscribing hierarchy in schools that are very strong. So last uh, week we had a guest speaker at Boston College. His name is Gabriel Camara. He's from Mexico. And for, for some of the older ones, when, when people of my generation um, entered teaching, you can't believe how exciting it was. There are all these big ideas out there. We would read people like Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, even Illich Schooling Society. It was a place of really big ideas. And there was a young uh, Mexican, his name was Gabriel Camara, who was there in Cuernavaca in Mexico. And he, he was in that circle of people. He got a doctorate from uh, Harvard, but he always wanted to stay very close to practice. And so it was in March of last year, I was in Toluca, Mexico, working in a remote rural school. And with the way that Gabriel Camara works with students is he has some work in tutorial relationships, but it's very Socratic. They teach the students, you can't give them the answers. This is the way you set up the tutorial and you have to take notes while that person is struggling to solve a problem. So you're, observe, you're becoming an observer of learning. He teaches this to Mexican middle school students. Okay. So I'm kind of in there and I'm kind of like, wow, this is really amazing. We're out kind of in the middle of nowhere and I'm seeing this really creative pedagogical energy. And my wife speaks very good Spanish. I, I speak some. And we're kind of walking around. You know how you visit a school, you have to find out, is this just window dressing or is this the real thing? And it seems to be the real thing. What was so impressed me on that visit was that we were seeing different students and teachers demonstrating their ability to solve some problems. And the principal of that school said, I realized that we were asking students to solve math problems that I didn't have the solution to. 
So I asked a student to tutor me, and now I would like to do a demonstration of how I solve this problem. You see, what, what that did is it humanized the learning, and the principal could emerge as a learner. So one of the six components in the German school prize is the school as a learning organization. And I, I dream that this would become a common practice. You, you know, th th that we could kind of come in and that that would be okay that the principal doesn't know everything. You know, I think that that's one thing. And then the first school that won the prize, um, it's the Robert Bosch Gesamtschule in Hildesheim. Um, the school wasn't getting enough students and so the teachers realized of their own initiative, we need to be observing each other and giving feedback. And then Wilfried Kretschmer, who was the school director, um, taught also. And so he got a colleague to come in and critique his teaching. And so I'm hoping that our school leaders um, can find this invitational, that, that it's okay that we don't know everything. And that if we can do that, then we can humanize the whole atmosphere of the school and um, you, you won't end up in situations where leaders feel like they need to be pretending that they know everything. So that, that's, that's one reflection. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid that we are running out of time, so I think I just had to say once again, thank you very much. It was so inspiring. Thank you. And uh, here's a, a little sweet gift well, thank that you. you can enjoy. I will know what to do with this. <laughs> I'm so glad we're here. A safe okay. trip home. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Once again.